so um, today we are going to talk about how to <clears throat> create user interfaces for your Python code. Um, it will be probably a bit long lecture, but I hope I will manage everything today. Um, so what we are going to use in this course is something called PyQt5, uh, which is a user interface module, which you can implement user interface where you can run on all platforms. So just to explain a bit about the platforms here. So you're probably already used to having, uh, there are different operating systems available for you to use uh, as on your laptop or your workstation. And the three major ones are Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. And if you look at those, all of these operating systems, they have uh, ways of creating user interfaces. So on Linux, you have something uh, called X11, which has a long history, even back to the uh, 70s, uh, which is a wrap, which is a library for creating user interfaces with implemented in C. On Windows, we are currently two uh, major runtime libraries. One is called Win32, which uh, also inherits its history back to the first versions of Windows. Uh, we have a modern C++ based user interface library called WinRT. Uh, and on Mac OS, we have uh, several kits now. So you have UI kit and you have NS kit, which are uh, which you can write user interfaces for your desktop operating system. So if you want to implement your application on, on these platforms, you basically have to write one application for each of these. And these will be different source codes because the, the libraries are very different. So you have one application for each platform. Uh, so you, you there's a lot of uh, extra code you have to write just to create the user interface. So how, how do you solve this? So I mean, there are today many special libraries which you um, are designed to shield the programmer from the details of these uh, user interface library for the different platforms. One of those is uh, Qt. And what they do is they provide a layer between. So instead of you writing one application for each uh, library or a platform, you write a single application uh, using the uh, APIs and the, the functions available in the Qt um, library. Uh, and Qt is C++ based. So if we want to write a Python application, we need something in addition to this library. So you, on top of this, you add something called a Python binding, which is a, a special connection between the, your Python code and C, the, the C++ libraries. So in essence, you, um, you create Python modules and Python classes that maps directly to the Qt C++ classes. It's very similar to what, what they did in, in NumPy, where you, uh, NumPy provides an interface between Python and the numerical libraries underneath that makes the uh, makes the numpy efficient so now instead of writing three different applications you can write a single application single source code that you can run on all of these platforms and for python that means is in in essence that you can take your python source code and just run it with a uh, uh, on windows and on on uh, linux and they look the same so this is the idea of, of uh, user interface libraries that they shield you from the differences between the different platforms, which is really nice. So Qt is a platform independent user interface library. and It abstracts all the user interface concept into a single library. So you never need to call any of the native functions that are available for the platforms. You can do that, but uh, if you do that, your application will have a dependency on that platform. Uh, another nice feature with Qt is that the user interfaces you create in Qt will look like the platform user interfaces. So uh, the library will adapt to the different uh, platforms that you, you have. So if you're running on a Mac, your application will look like a Mac OS application. And running on Windows, it will look like a Windows application. You can, of course, also style the user interfaces so you can create your own custom looks. If you want the application to look the same on all platforms, that's also a possibility. 
Um, another significant um, property of Qt is that it handles events like when you press a button, if you select a menu, uh, using a mechanism called signals or slots. And conceptually, you can think of it like connecting cables between a button to your code. So this, the signal is sent by the button and you create a slot in your code where you, you slot in uh, that cable and that makes a connection uh, and you can respond to events in your user interface code. So Qt, as I said before, is a C++ library, a, a large library. And to be able to use C++ libraries, you need to kind of create a Python binding. Uh, and that a Python binding is basically, it creates uh, placeholder clauses that represents the C++ clauses in Python. So basically you, you can use the C++ clauses to create Python object, which will communicate directly with the C++ library. Unfortunately, there are actually a lot of different bindings for Qt. So you have uh, PyQt5, which we'll use in this course. We also have Qt for Python, which is uh, Qt, the, the company behind Qt's own library. Uh, unfortunately, there are some licensing issues with that as well, so you have to be aware if you use that. And Python Qt. So, what is good is that the, Python, the bindings for the clauses are basically the same for all of these. So, uh, it's fairly simple to switch out um, the bindings. There is also a special binding called uh, Qt Pi, which makes that for you as well. So. But we are focusing on PyQt5 in this, this course. Um, also something that is very different from your program you have done up to now is that uh, user interface pro programs that provide user are often what's called event-based. And that means that they are uh, centered around a, a special kind of loop called an event loop. And what that event loop does is it just waits for messages from the operating system. So if you click on something in your user interface, uh, it goes into the event loop and you can, you can handle that in that event loop. Um, and it sends out the messages to your code. Uh, so, and the loop kind of continues to, until the last window has been closed in your application, then the loop exits. And in many of these cases, the event loop is not visible to you. In, in PyQt, uh, you basically call a function that enters the event loop and, and that function exits when the last window is closed. So all the functionality of your program has to be done through events. So if you want to, your program to do something, you have to connect an event from a button, for example, to your code. So the, the code basically just waits for something to happen. Um, this is a pseudo code for an event loop. So you have a flag called running is true. And as, as long as the program is running, I check for an event. If there is an event uh, button click, I just I have a function that co handles that event. It could be that it sends out signals to your code, more checks. And if the application quits, uh, the event loop terminates by it setting a flag and it exits this loop. So it's not very complex. So, Imagine a, a loop waiting for things to happen. So this is a main program in Qt. So uh, on top, we need to uh, import the system library sys to be able to um, exit your application in a, in a correct way. Um, the next line is uh, importing the Qt widgets um, mo uh, modules or, or classes. Um, and there are kind of three steps to your application creation is, first you need to create something called an application object. An application object is responsible for uh, all the um, mechanisms of, of having, running a user interface application. So it will manage the application windows, it will manage the, um, all the different states of the application. And then you have to create a widget or a window. Uh, you have to show your window and then you have to enter the application loop. So at the end here, let's see here if I can. Okay. 
So the main application loop is here. So app is the application object, and there is a method called exec underscore, which is a bit odd, but exec is already uh, taken in, in many of the libraries. So that they added the underscore here not to uh, conflict with other functions here. Exec goes into the loop, and basically in that function, the loop runs. And when, you're, when your last window is done, it will return an exit code and return from the execution and exit the application here. So let's see here if I can go to. So this is the actual code here. I have a, just to show you the mechanism here for running. And you see here, there is a lot of functionality already built in. So when I run this application, you can see this window here. Um, and this is a, already a simple Windows application running on my, my Windows platform. Uh, it handles resizing of the window. Uh, you can minimize it. So I can get back again. Maximize it again. Uh, and you can maximize it over the entire window. All that functionality is already built in in the application object. In a, in a, if you have, would have coded this directly in C in, C, in Windows, you would have, you have to create an application loop. You need to kind of respond to events on the resize uh, and all, a lot of things that are taken care of here uh, transparently for you. You don't have to think about this. So this is the main thing. So this application doesn't do much. It just kind of shows you a window. So let's continue here. So. So the widget is um, the Q widget class is, is the base class for all the user interface objects in Qt. And here, a lot of the things you learn from the object oriented uh, lecture will be applied. So uh, everything in Qt has a class and there is a large class hierarchy um, of uh, objects inheriting functionality from others. So for example, a button inherits a lot of functionality from Q widget. Uh, and many of these widgets can also contain other objects. So you can have a comp compost composite object consisting of many objects. Um, and if you create a widget without uh, a window, it, it will always create a window on the screen for you. Um, you can also derive custom application windows from the Q widget uh, base clause. So this is uh, another example here. I'll go back to. So here you have a, I defined my own window class here. So in this case, I have a my window class here, uh, which derives the functionality from the Q widget class. I call the Q widget class in uh, constructor. I have a special uh, function here for initializing my, my uh, user interface. In this case here, I set my geometry, which is the size of the window and position. So. 300 by 300, the position of the window, 600 by 600 is the size. And I also set a window title here and I show here. So now my window is, a, is, is, a, is an own window, which I had, had uh, specialized by um, deriving from Q widget. And here I, I start my, create my app object and I create my own window here. And you see here, I, I built in the show here. So it, it will automatically show itself here when I run this. Now you see it's called my window instead of uh, Python before as before. And also you see that it will be placed on the same place on the screen. So this is the position 300 by 300. And here, this is a 600 pixel wide window, a 600 pixel height window. So 600, 600 is internal area here. So it's not including the title bar. So in addition to so be able to use your program, you need to, to uh, create um, uh, user interface controls. And uh, basically what you do is you create more objects which you attach uh, to the main, main queue widget or window. So in this case here, I create a self.button here. And the self here is that I want to be able to refer to this button further on in the code. If I don't put self here, the button object will only be visible in the init GUI method. 
and uh, not, not you will not have a reference to this object later on. And I create a Q push button object. So this uh, this is a Q push button class. I create the button. The first parameter here is the the text of the button, and the self here is the uh, object that is going to own this button. So in this case, I refer uh, I put in self here, which means it will be owned by my window class. I can set a tooltip here. I can set uh, the size of the button here, and I can move it to a position here. And the move here refers to the, the window coordinate. So in top left window, the position, uh, the coordinate is zero, zero. So, and it goes down positively and right in positive direction here. So let's see what happens now. So now I create a, a window here and you see here that there is a button here. Uh, and it's called press me, which is correct. It positioned 50 by 50 here. So this is a coordinate 50 by 50 and it's 100 pixels wide and 50 pixels height. And already now it can, it can handle when you move the, the cursor over it, it will highlight and you can press it here and so on. And I think also there is a hint text here. So if you, if you move, leave the mouse hanging above the button, it will display a uh, hint text. So without writing any uh, own code for doing this, there's a lot of functionality built into the button. So it's not just enough to kind of create a lot of buttons. You also need to be able to uh, you need also to be able to uh, respond to the event. So if you click a button, uh, you probably want to call your code to do something, or do a computation or do a visualization, read a file or, and so on. And uh, this is handled by using uh, events and signals. Uh, and there are uh, properties on the buttons and controls that you can assign um, connections to your code. So for example, if I want to uh, respond to the clicked event on the button, I can uh, I say my button dot clicked dot connect. So connect is the, the method to kind of connect uh, user interface object with your code. So in this case, I provide self dot on my button clicked. Uh, that will connect the button to actual code. Uh, I provided some links here to documentation. There, there's do links and documentation in, in the in canvas as well. Um, unfortunately, there is no really good Python documentation, but the documentation for C++ is very similar to the, the calls. You can figure out the calls from looking at the C++ documentation. So let's see here, I have another example. So we have the same example here. We have my button here. Uh, I connect my button here using the, the clicked event and I connect that to self on button clicked, which is a method I have added to my class here. So I don't have to add a self here. I, I just, and I also don't set the parentheses here because I, what, what I actually connect here is the function object and that is on button clicked. So when you define a function in a class, this will actually be an object which you can refer to, which you assign here. Uh, and I, what I do here is I print hello here to show you that something happens when I click the button here. So if I run this now, there is a, my, a button here now, and if I press it, it will display hello here. This is, uh, this is the way you do it. Uh, you you, you uh, look at what property you want to respond to. So in this case, there is also a event pressed, which is uh, activated when you help hold down the button. Uh, and for example, if you have another control, for example, a list box, there's a special event called current row changed, which you also can use connect to, to uh, when you want to respond to this event. So 
many of, many of the objects uh, derived from QWidget share a lot of uh, common properties. So, for example, uh, you can make a control uh, visible or invisible, and that is done by using the set visible uh, method. And you can query if it's visible using the uh, is visible function. Uh, and there's also set enabled and is enabled. So sometimes you want to be able to show to the user there is a control, but it's not active for the moment. And then you can use the set enabled method to disable or enable the control. It could be that you haven't uh, saved your settings and that's why you can't run your uh, execute, uh, execute your calculation. And then you the calculate button is uh, disable until all the prerequisites are, are there for um, clicking on it. That's also a good idea to kind of prevent code from being executed when you are, uh, your program is not in the correct state. And the same thing here, you can do is enabled to check if your control is enabled. Focus is a special property when you have, for example, text boxes. Uh, the control that has focus often has the cursor inside it. So you can you can say tell the user interface that I want focus to a certain text box, for example. Uh, fonts is handled the same way. Also, the text if, if a controller has a text, usually uh, you change the text by, by calling set text, and you can return the text on a control by using the dot text method. So this is a code that I create uh, three buttons here, uh, and I connect two buttons, uh, two uh, methods to this uh, the click events of the controls. And in the first event, I will check if the second button is visible. If it's visible, I will set that button to false. Uh, otherwise, I set it to true. And if I click the second button, I will check if the button three is enabled. And if it's enabled, I will set uh, disable the control by setting the set enable to false, and then set enable to true. So if I click the first button here, you see here that I set visible to false on the, on the second control, and that button went away. If I click again, it will show again. And if I click the second button here, I disable this control. And now I can't click on this control anymore. I can only click it when it's enabled. So this is a way of, of uh, controlling, um, showing and hiding uh, controls, also enabling disabling controls. Um, you can also control some of the properties of the windows that you create. So uh, this is, uh, you can, for example, uh, the Qt window is a standard way of showing it, that is default. You can have a, you can also provide, make sure, show the windows as a dialog box, which is not resizable. And if you want a smaller uh, title bar, you can use, use something called a Qt tool window here. I'll just show how this looks like on Windows. This is a normal window, nothing fancy. I uncomment the constructor here. Now you see I get the dialog box and I, um, I get a special helper tool here, but there is no maximize button here. And you can do a tool window. Now I get this kind of special uh, title bar here with a smaller button here. Uh, usually these are for uh, floating toolbars or floating controls um, windows that you want on top of your application. Uh, you can also control the state of your window. So if, for example, if you, if you want your window to be shown all over, uh, on the entire screen, 
you can you can use the set window state here to uh, control the, the the window maximize or uh, if it should be shown on uh, maximize to the entire screen there's also possibility to use a uh, window full screen that means that uh, your window will uh, cover the entire screen, but it also uh, the title bar will also be hidden. So it's basically covering the entire desktop. And, and for some application, this could be uh, like, like games, for example, you want them to run full screen. So let's see here what happens if I uh, run uh, maximized here. Oh, I forgot to close my other window here. I will restart my code environment here in a moment. So sorry for that. I'll see if I can get it to run. So now you see that the, the window is covering my entire screen. If I then run with with full screen here. You need to know the, how you exit the window, which is in on Windows, it's Alt F4 to close a window. So if I run this now, this will cover my entire screen. So another uh, important part of user interfaces is often a, to have a, a menu bar or a, a menu hierarchy on top of your window. So in, in Qt, you have several classes that implement uh, menu bar. So you have the main classes called Q menu bar, which is uh, which implement uh, kind of owns the other menus. And then you have menus that you create and add to this menu bar. And every menu has a special uh, object called a Q action object connected to it. And that is actually what is connecting to your code. Uh, an action is a, the reasons we have action objects is that when you look at normal user interfaces in, in, in uh, Windows application or Mac applications for that matter, you usually have menus and you have toolbars. And many of these, both menus and toolbars have called the same code. And in that case, you, you uh, don't want to kind of duplicate code all over the place. So what, what the Q action does is that you connect the Q action to both the toolbars and also to the menu. Uh, and the action also contains uh, information on, on the shortcut key that you can use to, to, to call this 
action as well. So it encapsulates uh, the, the entire action you want to do from the menu and the toolbar. Uh, you also specify uh, any icons or things inside action objects. And you connect your own uh, code to the action object and not directly to the menus. So here you have an example of, of creating a menu. Uh, so what we first do is we cre create action object. So I have my, my action object here and I name my action. This is also the text that appears in the toolbar and also in the menu. You attach that to my own window. You can set a shortcut here in, in, in this example. Uh, this action can be um, executed by pressing control T. Uh, an action has an event called triggered, which you connect to your own code. So in this case, I connect to my action here, which is here below here. So I also have a, uh, I need to create a menu bar and that is uh, done by uh, adding menus to the menu bar. And, and when you want to have menus in your in your applications, you need to derive from a queue main window clause here. And this clause has a special function here that will return you the menu bar object. And to this, you can add menus, for example, add menu file, then you get back your file menu object. And on this file menu, you can add actions. So in case, I just add my action to this uh, menu. So let's see how this look here. Um, menu one. So if I run this now, I get my code here. I have a menu up here, my action. So this is the uh, file menu uh, option here, which I created. Uh, and this is the menu bar object up here. And then you see here that the information that I provided for my action is, a, is shown in the menu here. So I, I can see the name and also the, the shortcut, um, which, you can, which you also can use. So if I, if, if, I, if I select the menu here now, you see that it shows you a dialog box, but then I can also press control T, which also brings up uh, this um, calls this the same method in my code. So that is quite uh, nice that you can combine those. So, so you, you create all your actions in your user interface and then you connect them to either menus or toolbars. And in this case here, I, I can easily also add a toolbar by uh, calling uh, the add toolbar method on my Q main window instance. And just <clears throat> can, I can, to this toolbar, I can add an action here. Uh, which is the same action as, that I created before. So I just added this part here to my code and I just added my action once again to this toolbar here. Now you see here that I have my window again and now I have a toolbar here as well, which I can use. A nice thing here that Already without any code, I can move around my toolbar like this. So that this is built in functionality in Qt. And if I click this one, it will show the ouch method here again. And uh, here is a bit larger example here uh, with a, a complete menu with a, I have new file, open file, save file, exit, cut, copy, paste. And here you see how to create all these, these things here. So I create my file menu, which I add my actions to. If I want to uh, separate some things in my menus, so I can do add a separator that will add a line in the menu. And then the action here, I uh, create a menu bar uh, here and I add my other actions here. And the same way I create my, my toolbars like this. They have basically the same uh, methods like the, the main menu. So if I run this, now I have a toolbar or menus here. And you see here, I have attached icons to the actions here as well. And those appear both in the menu, but also in the toolbar like this. And I can move them around like this. I have two toolbars. We can have a bit both of the side here.
And the icons here, I uh, you can add by using the set icon, and then you can have queue icon, and then you specify file name. So these files are in this directory where I run my code. Well, those will be loaded uh, and displayed in the toolbar. Uh, so up to now, I have placed the controls using X, Y coordinates in my window, using the top zero, zero, and then placing the controls uh, by specifying exactly the coordinates. Uh, this can have problems when you, have, when you have more controls, is that when you resize the window, no, none of the controls will move. They will kind of be placed at the same position in the window all the time. So. In Qt, you have two options. So either you use the absolute positioning, which we have been using up to now, or you use something called sizers. And sizers are special uh, objects for automatically arranging controls in a window. And it's probably better to show you how this works. So for example, I have four buttons, button one, two, three, and four. I create these objects here in my code. And then I, I uh, create a sizer called VBox Layout. And I add all my widgets to this VBox Layout. And I uh, set the window layout on my, on my screen using set layout here. Uh, and what this does is that everything you throw into a VBox, that will be a control in itself. And it will own those, those controls. And it will automatically resize and depending on uh, how the windows is sized according to certain rules. So if I go to VBox Sizer, so you see here I have a, my four buttons here, and what happens now when I pull down here, it will automatically distribute those buttons um, in the window. Um, some of the control the dimensions are restricted. So for example, the button height uh, is uh, is by default, can't be sized. But if we can size it in another direction, then the button is, is uh, extended in that direction. There is also something called the um, H-box layout, which is kind of the opposite. You throw in the controls here, and they are, raised, they are arranged horizontally instead of vertically. So now I see my controls like this. They are sized in the middle and they are stretched out like this when you do like this. Uh, you can combine these. So uh, by combining the VBox layout and the HBox layout, you can create kind of most of the kind of controls you or user interfaces you, you need. And what you can do is to kind of, if you sketch on the paper, you can, you can perhaps you have four controls that are vertical and, and some that are horizontal. And then you group them together and, and, and see how you can combine these to a nested um, layout, so to speak. So in this case, here I have, I have my eight buttons in this case. Uh, four of them I want to have vertically and uh, four of them horizontally. And the six, five, six, and seven, eight should be underneath the one, two, three, and four. So what I do here, I have a, I create a, a vertical box for all the controls in my entire window. And then I add my horizontal controls to a special H box here, which I add to the V box here. So you can, you can nest layouts. You can put layouts inside other layouts. Uh, it's also possible to add springs. That kind of sounds strange, but sometimes you don't want the controls to be spread evenly. Then you can put the spring that is placed between the controls here, and that will push the controls up here. And that is called, this is done with this add stretch method here in the VBox. So now we have our another user interface. We have my four buttons here, and, and we have, have the HBox sizer here which is the last item in, in the VBox uh, layout. Uh, and then inside here, we have a HBox layout here. And we, when we size it here now, this spring here, invisible spring, will expand and push these controls up on the top. Same thing here, we have a button here that is uh, 
there is a spring between these here, and that, that will push these buttons here to the right and keep this button here on this on the left side. You also it, it, you can't push them together, so there are um, minimum sizes of, of the controls that the layout can't kind of um, um, force. So that will kind of freeze the controls on on the on the in the window. Um, I will show you a tool later on which will enable you to do this uh, graphically using a special software. Then you don't have to do this in code because the, the code can be there can be a lot of code when you do this. So, um, but I will show you the manual way first, and then you should show you automatic way later on. Uh, there is also a special control called grid layout. So if you know that your user interface is kind of based on a grid, you can place the controls uh, using rows and columns instead of exact coordinates. So for example, here you have, I add to the add widgets here, button one at zero, zero. So this is the row uh, zero and, and column zero. And then you add your controls in that virtual coordinate system like that. Uh, you can also, the same thing, you can set column stretch and row stretch to different ways that the different controls stretch in different ways inside this grid control. It's a bit complicated an example. Uh, you will get all this code to experiment yourself. And uh, I will just show you how it looks here. So grid layout. So I have my nine buttons here. So if I drag here, you see that the middle button will stretch in both directions. Uh, the, the other ones would be kept like this. So you can also, man, instead of buttons here, you can have other layout controls that, that contain other buttons. So you can create kind of uh, areas with different user interface controls here. And also, uh, this, the, if you want to the, the, your controls to be able to expand, uh, not like the def default settings, you can specify this using the set size policy method here, which will tell the control, it's okay to expand in X direction, it's okay to expand in the Y direction. Uh, sometimes you don't want to write a lot of user interface code and, and uh, Qt provides a lot of standardized dialog boxes which you can use. Uh, so that you don't have to um, create these manually. So for example, if you just want to show a message on the screen, it, it would be nice that you uh, not have to write your own Q widget and place text on it. And you can just call a function to display a, a window. Uh, you can also ask the user for uh, files by calling a file dialog. Um, and you can also ask the user for selecting colors. So I got the question here, uh, is the way to resize the text font as well as resizing the window? Um, there is no layout manager can resize the font aut automatically, but you can change the font sizes in the controls. So um, that is also, so there is a set font method that you can set the font of the control. So for example, if you want to show a simple dialog box, uh, uh, something happened, uh, that is called uh, information box. And you, use, you call that using the Q message box um, module, and then you, you uh, call the information method on that. The first parameter is always the, uh, oh, the, the owning window. So every window you create needs to be, have a, an owner. And in this case, I just provide self, which is my own window. Uh, and then the second parameter is the caption in the window. And the final parameter is the message that I want to display. So I have my open dialogue here. And it shows you a standard message box. And message boxes on a, um, 
So this is actually a function that calls the underlying platform function that provides the standardized platform message box. So this will, uh, if you look at my slide here, on a Mac, it will look something like that. On a Windows, it looks like that. And on a, on a Linux machine, it will provide the standardized message box for, for Linux as well. So it, it's kind of um, uses what the platform has underneath. Uh, information boxes is kind of a friendly message that something has happened. It's not, I would not classify as an error, but you have different method, different message boxes for different things. So uh, this is a critical message box. And this is usually when something has gone really bad um, and you want to, to convey this to the user. There's also a warning here. And I, I, I'm always uh, careful about displaying both the warning and, and the critical because that's kind of a um, bit unfriendly to show up and, and it needs to be kind of um, something is wrong with a file or something that is kind of critical. You shouldn't just display it, my calculation has finished and display a critical warning message. Uh, you should use the information box instead that is much politer. The warning could be yeah, it's in between, but I would rather go with an information message than a, than a warning message. There are some other messages that can be also kind of quite nice. For example, if you want to ask the, the user, uh, are you sure that you want to run this? Uh, and then you want to ask yes or no, for example. There is a special question, um, book, question method you can use to actually ask questions. And, and you will get back a result that is either yes or no, and you can act accordingly. This is dialogs four. So this is a message box. You can ask yes or no. You can also specify which of these will be the default. So if I press enter here now, it will say no. Uh, so this is good if you want to erase a file. You should perhaps the default should be no. So if I press yes here, you can check that yeah, the user pressed yes. No. And if I just press enter here without clicking, it will automatically default to no. So this, this final uh, thing here is the, the default value, which is no. Uh, another common, um, I think we do a, a short five minute break or yeah, it's like 10 minute break now. So we will back at 13 over. Okay, let's continue. So there are some other dialog boxes that can also be useful. So for example, um, you want to, you want to, the user to be able to select the file. So there are um, a special called Q5 dialog, which uses, uh, which you have two methods, get open file name and get save file. And those will open this, the platform dialogs for selecting a file. So it will look like, um, like, look like a Mac selection here. So in this case, it uses the Mac version. Uh, and it will also use the Windows version if you run it on Windows. So let's see here. All right. So you specify here get open file name, the owner of the win owner of the dialogue, uh, the title, uh, default file name if you need that, and also the a filter for displaying a certain kind of input. In this case, it will filter for IMP files. So it will only show uh, files with the extension IMP. So this is how it looks on Windows. So here you see a standard file dialog on Windows. And you see here that I have a filter here uh, for the, the, select, the files that I can select. I can change it here by specifying like this, and then I can select the file here, open, and it shows you, in, it returns you the, a, a string with a complete path to the file name. So you can use that in an open dial, open file method to can open files.
there is also a special get save file name that you can specify a new file name as a non-existing file name. And uh, you can also select where to save that file and it will return you a full path um, to a new file name. So it will not create the file, but it will create a, uh, return you the complete file name and path to, of, of a new file. So in this case, I can do uh, test one, save. And you see here that it, it will have a complete file path and it will also automatically add the extension IMP to the file name. So if you have a filter specified in your code here, it will add that to your file, the, the file name that is returned from the function. So let's go through uh, quickly the different controls that you have available. So there is a multitude of predefined controls that correspond to, to several standardized user interface controls. So you have, of course, buttons, which we already looked at. Um, you, you have checkboxes, which uh, are used to, um, the users be able to check a state of something, uh, options. Radio buttons, which are basically checkboxes, but are grouped and only one of these um, uh, objects can be selected at the same time. So let's see here, we run a checkbox here. So it's created using like a button here. So instead of button, you specify a Q checkbox. Uh, you can, there is a method called set checked, which, which uh, you can set in uh, code to either true or false, and it, it will show a check mark if it's true. There's also an event called state change, which you can connect to your own code, which is triggered every time that state changes of the control. So here you have a checkbox extra alt. If I click this one, it will show it is not checked, and it has, it is, it is checked. So what I do here in the control, I do checkbox check state, which will return the current state of the control, uh, which you can use to kind of decide different things in your code. We have a radio button, which uh, always they only make, they only make sense if you have multiple of them. So only one of these controls can be active or checked at the same time. So in this case, I have, I have two ones: one extra alt and one init, and. Uh, when I click on one of them, the other one will be disabled. So in this case, if I pre press this one here, you see that uh, the, the extra alt was disabled. And now it's the other one is disabled. So this is a way of letting the users check from a list of options. Um, if you want to have multiple radio button groups, you need to put them in group controls. Otherwise, they will every radio button will be part of the same group in the control. So you need to kind of group them logically. You can put them in uh, sizers or you can put them in groups. Uh, a combo box is a special um, selection box which uh, provides a user to select if you have a lot of options, it can be hard to can display all of them in the, in the window. Uh, this is a special control box. We'll drop down a list where you can select uh, different items from. And the, the nice thing with the combo box, it takes very little space. Uh, it also has a current item changed when you change something. There's also a method called current index, which will return the current selected item. So in this case here, I have a create a combo box. There is no title you have to specify here. So you just create an uh, combo box with the owner. I place places at 20 by 20. I add alternatives here. So I have four options for the user to check. 
I set the default uh, check to to the, this, the third index. So so four is the so zero, one, two, and three. So this is the last item is already checked, and I, I uh, connect my current index change event to my method here. So now you see here I have my combo box here. The the alternative four is pre-selected. And there is a small button here, uh, drop down here. If I click here, it will show me all the options I, I can check here. So now I see you, you chose two. And you can also get the text out of this here. So the alternative three is the text that is displayed here in the control. So you see the current text is what I displayed last year. Uh, sometimes you want to use it to be able to enter values in a kind of easy way, and a slider can be an option for that. So uh, it provides you, uh, you can set a min value, a max value, and also some steps uh, if you want kind of spe specific values uh, in the input. So the code here, you can have either vertical sliders or you can have horizontal sliders. And that is specified by the QT vertical or QT horizontal here. Then you can set the maximum value of the slider and a minimum value. So that is the range uh, from where the, the values can uh, be. And you can set value that sets the default value of the slider. Then you can also, there's an event called value change, which you call every time the, the slider changes, it calls a method of your choice. So I have actually um, been a bit lazy here. So I connect both of these uh, events to the same method here. And that's quite okay to do that. So value change is connected to all value change. And I just print out the values here every time I, I move the slider. So if I run this, so now you see I have two sliders here, one vertical and one horizontal. And if I run here, you can see that it updates, it calls the value change every time it updates here. And you see that the minimum values is zero, maximum value is 100. Um, if you have more space in your room and want to show the user uh, a list of options, uh, this you can use the list box instead of a comma box. So this will display a box of items in it where you can the user can select. Either you can um, configure it to only allow selection of one, but you can also have a multiple selection if you want uh, a multiple selection as well. And if you add things that add more things in the list box, then it can be displayed. Uh, it will also automatically display scroll boxes next to the control so that the user can scroll down to more options. Oh, sorry, this one, this box. So now you see I uh, filled my box here with a uh, hundred uh, values here. Uh, list and you use add item to add things to this. And you see here now there are more options than can be displayed in this box. So I can scroll down here, up and down in this list. When I click, it will display a value here. So it, it works much in the same way as the, the combo box here. So you, you connect current row changed, that is the event, and then you can connect that to your own code here. And, and then you can, uh, you get also the current uh, uh, index of the selection, but you can also get from the list box itself, it, it has a method that always shows the current item and then you can retrieve the text here. Uh, one very common control is the ability to actually enter values in, in a form in some way. And uh, the control to do that in, in uh, Qt is the Q line edit control. Uh, and you can set the text with set text and you can retrieve the text using the dot text method. So in this case here, I, I create a line edit here. Uh, no options here. I set the text to text and then I can do message box information here. Uh, when, when, uh, and, and then you can retrieve the line edit text like this. So you see here, you can edit text here. 
then you can retrieve the text in the current control. So this is when you do your user interface later on in this course, uh, you will probably need to uh, query text controls, convert them to values, and also go the other way around to take your values and display them in the text box. Uh, so there is no uh, there are, um, floating point text controls in Qt. You need to kind of do the conversion yourself. There are some controls for selecting integers, but floating point is something you have to manage yourself. So now I just want to kind of give you an um, introduction how you can manage your user interface code in a, in a nice way. So uh, what I, I have some rules here. So it's very important that you don't mix user interface code with simulation models. I, I, I always try to strictly divide my code into one uh, source code for the user interface and one source code tree for my um, simulation models. So basically, uh, in my user interface case, I, I instantiate the simulation model object, for example, and I interact with that model uh, using methods and properties. Uh, and the ma main functionality of your simulation code should be in the module where you define your, sim uh, your class for your simulation, for example. So you keep that separate. That is also important if you want to move your code to, for example, a web-based user interface, you can just uh, add a uh, separate um, user interface, a uh, Python user interface for a web interface, for example, but you still have your simulation code intact and it doesn't refer to any QT object at all. It just refers to its own description of the problem. Uh, and also it's important that you handle the, the update of the user interface in a consistent way. So I usually try to put all my code for updating controls in a, in a method in, in, the, in the QT window class. And I also have a, a, a separate method for updating my model from the user interface. So basically one method to fill the controls and one method to, to retrieve the values from the controls. Um, and also um, you need, you can, in, in your um, code, you can have, a, so the reading of files should be done in your simulation code. Uh, you can specify the file names from the user interface and you assign that to the model and call your code, your, your mod module with all your simulation or numerical code. Um, and that you don't have to kind of have user interface code in your, in your model code. So this is a simple example here that, uh, I'm sorry for the Swedish here, but uh, so I have my model here. I have my model uh, values here as properties. Um, and uh, I store them here. So this is a, then it's completely separate from the user interface code. And then I have my user interface code and I have a update controls will, will take the model values and fill the controls here. So in this case, I fill my text edit boxes. Uh, I convert to strings if you have uh, floating point values. If I have uh, multiple values I have to check different depending on the, the values in the, in the in the model and then I have the other way around so going from values in the controls to my model I have to do the other way around so model text value um, and then I, I have a floating point conversion here uh, I have checked my options here and here it's also important that you handle errors for example so if, if the user enters text instead of floating point or numeric values it should produce a, an error message here. So to just explain a little bit, uh, a complete example here, uh, I will do something for my area here, which is uh, structural mechanics. So I will do a simply supported beam uh, and I will implement that, uh, the, the beam model in a separate class and I will create a user interface in another class um, and, and show how to interact with those. So this is the, extremely advanced theory here. I have a point load that is placed on a beam and it's uh, controlled by the parameters A and B where the position is. Uh, it's, the beam is, uh, it has a force of P and then I can get uh, section forces and uh, moments along the beam. Uh, and so I don't think uh, it's not set. You can look it up. It's not very complicated. So, um, 
what I want to be able to do is I want to create a beam a class for a simply supported beam. So the user, user of this class should be able to create a beam object, set all the properties for this model, uh, and then call. Uh, it will automatically return you the section forces, the, the deflection, and also the moments along the beam. So I, 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 this is the kind of the way I want to use this class. Uh, so I have methods for deflection, methods for uh, section force, and methods for the moments here. So the first thing we have to do is, is create a class constructor. So I, I want to use properties here. So I, uh, I want to be able to um, control the values of my, my, my model here. So make sure that the user only enters the correct values. So that's why I properly. So the double underscores here means that these are private uh, uh, class attributes. I have some, some that are calculated this year. So the total length of the beam is L. It's calculated by adding these together. And I set some decent default values here. Uh, next, I also add a special method here to be able to handle uh, floating point conversions from strings in a, in a transparent way. So for example, in this case here, uh, the new value the user enters here, uh, and I also preserve the old value here. So uh, this routine tries to convert to a floating point value. If it fails, it will just return the old value. So this, in this, this way, you can kind of protect yourself very easily for uh, uh, when they enter things strangely in a text box. If you, if you enter um, a character instead of a number, the just old number will kind of be converted back again. So uh, then I add my uh, get and set methods here. So uh, I return my A, B, uh, also here is set A, you see here, I use the two, two float method here to make sure that uh, I always uh, get the correct value in my uh, class attribute. And then I define my properties in this case. So I have my A, B, L, P, E, and Y. Um, the L property is read only because you can't set the L, you, you just, because it depends on A and B. So, in this case, uh, the user can only return the value of the, the total length. Um, and then I create my functions here for calculating uh, the deflections here. Um, and in this case here, this, this construction is just to make it more easy to write my, my um, uh, variable references my, in my formula. So I don't have to write self A every time. And this works perfectly because as you know, Python variables are references. So A will reference self A, so it, it's uh, completely okay to do this. And that, that makes it more kind of nice to write these expressions here in a in much easier way. And I do add my V method and M method here as well. So now I want to create a user interface for this. So the idea is that I can, the user can enter, enter numbers here and, and it will display a, table here of the, the X position from uh, the left side, the deflections, the section forces, and the moments. So what I do now, now is I create a separate module for my user interface. And the separate model, in my separate model, I will refer to my B model. So I will import the B model uh, module uh, as BM. And then I will create a beam window class uh, and here I will make sure I create a beam object and uh, attach that to my uh, as a class attribute. I will initialize the GUI, uh, update my controls. So I, I take the values on the beam, fill my controls, uh, update the text edit. So here uh, is the init GUI method, it's just a way of organizing all my user interface codes in one in one function. I create all my controls. Uh, I also add uh, um, when the user uh, taps or press enter or something, uh, there is an event called editing finish will be, which we'll call. And I connect that to a special method. And that enables us to kind of automatically update the table when the, when the value changes. 
So this is the basic layout. So I have update controls that will take uh, the model values and place them in the control. So in this case, I will, uh, so A edit, set text, and get the value from beam A, and just fill the text boxes with values. Uh, and the text edit here is the table construction. So here I will actually loop around and fill the text edit box with, with the output from our calculations here. And then that, the other way around, I will do uh, when the user enters something in the controls, I will assign the values on, on the B model here. And the nice thing now that we did um, the two float method, you can actually give that a text method so here. And also if there's something wrong in the text coming in from the control, uh, the old, old value will be used automatically. So I don't have to do any special error handling here. That's all we're taking care of in the model. And then we, uh, when you edit the text uh, on edit and finish, I will update the controls here as well. So uh, first it will update the model, then we'll update, create the table, and then I will update the controls again. So a finished program will look something like this. So this is the beam model code. I have my class here. I also have a test program here in the, in the end that I can run this code without any user interface. So if I run this here now, it will just display a table of values here. And then I have a user interface code that imports the B model, creates the B model here, and then we use that uh, in, when we uh, update the controls here to retrieve the values here. So if you run this, So if I, for example, I change a value to two, and when you click here, it will automatically update the, the table here. Uh, we can also see that it goes to four now. Uh, we can change the force to 500. Every time I move from a control, it will automatically uh, initiate this edit with finished. So, now, so this code now is completely separated. So um, the B model module doesn't know anything about the user interface. It's completely separated. Uh, and uh, it doesn't even know that we are kind of using it in, a, in, a, in the user interface. So for example, I can write another module that is called Beam Web UI. And I can just import my Beam model into this model and I can create a user interface, a web-based user interface with the same source code from my Beam model. So this is a so golden rule: separate user interface code from uh, your 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 model code or your your numerical code, uh, so they are separate. It's tempting to kind of uh, write uh, computational code in your uh, event methods, but don't. <laughs> so let's see. Here. I'm just going to find the right code now here. Okay, so as I said, many of these, uh, uh, the layout of the user interface code is somewhat complicated, especially if you have, let's say that you have over 200 controls in your user interface, and that's not uncommon that you have, if you count all the menu items and the actions and those checkboxes, it can quickly grow. So you, sometimes you need a tool that can pro, provide you with, that you can design your user interface in, in your code. Uh, and Qt Designer is an application that is uh, actually available through uh, Anaconda. It comes with Anaconda, but it's a part of the Qt uh, software that's available from the, the company Qt. Uh, and, and here you can create a description of the user interface. Uh, it will generate a special XML file format that describes a user interface. And it also help you lay out the code and you can preview your code. Uh, the files that are generated is called UI files and those you can import into Python and it will create all the objects for you automatically. Um, so let's see here. Um, 
And what you do is that you uh, you need to add a, an additional import here, PyQtify UIC. A UIC is a user interface compiler that will take this UI description and create objects for you. So in this case here, I have init GUI. I've removed all my user interface uh, object creation here. I just load UI and then I specify the file name for my user interface. And I specify here where it should add objects. So this is the owner object. And in the load UI will actually, all the objects created will be attached to self. So as I will show you shortly, there is a push button object inside my UI file. And this object uh, use name in, in the Qt designer and it will be available here as an, as, a, as an object. And you can use that exactly like you did with your manually uh, created um, controls. So let's see here. Um, I will try to do this again. So I will open Qt designer. And uh, Qt Designer looks something like this. And uh, let's see, it usually comes up when you started uh, asking you for um, what kind of product you want to create. So in this case, um, I will create a widget. So widgets is the simplest form of user interface. If you don't know anything, and you don't need a menu, you just want something that has a window and, and controls on it, you can use the widget control. So what I can do here is I can just uh, select that, uh, create. And now you get uh, an empty window here. And this is the, the window you, you create. So um, on, the, on the left side here, you have all the uh, user interface objects you can add to this window. On the right side here, you have the object hierarchy here. So now you see I have a widget form. And here are all the properties of this widget here. So in this case, you can see I have a, uh, the geometry, this is the size, so also where the, the, this is positioned. Uh, if I change here, you can see that the properties will change automatically here. Uh, and here we also can change when you have um, um, the name of the control. So in this case, I want to create, a, let's see, I want to have buttons on the left side, right side, and something in the middle here. So I will, what, what I usually do is just lay out the controls um, in, in approximately the way I want it. So in this case here, I you click on a button, you should drag it over here. And I just add more one or this like this. And you see here that this is the object structure being created. And the names that are specified here is, is the uh, variable names that you will use in your code as well. So self push button, for example. You can change the name here. So for example, I select this one here, push button like that. Uh, this will be the name in, in the code. And then I want some buttons here on the other side. And then I need some controls here on the bottom as well. So these should be vertical oriented. So what I can do now is I can select these controls like this. And I, on top here, you have different ways of laying out. So this is the uh, horizontal layout. This is the vertical layout. There are some for uh, splits. I don't cover this here. This is the grid layout. And uh, so this should be vertical. I just do this one here. And then they are connected together in a separate, you can see here that the object layout changes here to a vertical layout. And then the my buttons are contained inside here. This is what we did manually in code before. So this is uh, very much simpler to handle this. So same thing with these ones here. I will do them vertically like this. And these should be uh, horizontal like that. And then I want a text editor here in the middle here. So I will drag, um, uh, let's see here, text edit here. Uh, make it a bit bigger here. So the main layout of user interface should be, uh, I have one column here, second column here, a third column here. So this is a um, horizontal layout, this one here. 
So what I can do now is I can mark these, all of these controls here and say that these should be laid out like this. And then I, this will be the second row in this vertical layout here. So I will just, I can just say that, uh, click on my main window and say that this should be arranged like this. So I have the main layout is, is vertical. So I have two rows and three columns inside this one here. But now I, I want these two, these buttons looks kind of ugly. I want them to be on top, uh, at the top of the window. So there are actually uh, spacers or springs that you can add here. So I can take a vertical spacer and just place it inside here and that will expand and push the buttons up. And the, the, the buttons here on the, on the lower row here, I want them to be pushed together in the middle. Then I can put two springs, one on the left side and one on the right side here. And they are centered like this. So now I have done my, my user interface and I save this here and it will save, um, let's see here. I will save that as uh, form six UI, like that. And now I go back to my code and I change this to six. And I, okay, I see I have a, the wrong name here. So I need to change my name in my, my Qt Designer to press me button. Uh, so let's go back to Qt Designer and we change this one to Press me button like that. Save it again. And we run this code here. And now you see, instead of having like tons of user interface code in my Python code, I just have a single line that loads everything and creates all these objects for me automatically. And my button here, if I press this button here, it should, uh, yes, it calls my method here. So you can see that I have my button pressed here called. So <clears throat> this is quite nice. Um, what you have to think about uh, some rules when you use it is name things in a easily identifiable way. So for example, if you have an edit control, I usually call it something like uh, uh, main edit. So I usually have a, uh, the, the name, the type of control as, this, the, as, a, as a, a suffix with underscore. Then I know that this is an edit control and I can remember that. Same thing with a push, push button here. I usually call it the name of the button and an underscore button to kind of illustrate that it should be um, as a button control. Name them consistently because you don't want to remember, okay, is the A value, it should be connected to push button underscore 33, that is kind of hard to remember. Another thing that, so if you browse down in this properties here, so you can see the properties of the different controls here. So the push button is the, is the kind of uh, um, the, the, the actual uh, clause. It has, um, it inherits a lot of properties from the abstract button. So this is very object oriented structure. And here you can set, for example, the text of the button here. Uh, you can set an icon, you can, you can set um, other options here. So the first property is uh, that is always on all objects is the object name. And then the, the Q widgets generic properties is the yellow ones here. And then, then it specializes to your controls here. So you, you have to uh, browse down a bit to kind of see the different controls here, or the properties of the controls. So this is kind of very easy way to do user interfaces. So that was my presentation for today. Um, I will, so uh, I will encourage you to, so many of these things you can't do in a notebook. You need to do those from either Spider or from Visual Studio Code when you run these. 
Uh, all of the code I showed today, all of the Python examples are uh, in an archive that you can download from, from, uh, from Canvas. I also provided some links to the documentation of, of Qt. Um, there is also an assignment where you can integrate. Um, uh, uh, you should do a function plotter. That is the assignment for this Qt assignment here. So it will be a window where you can enter a function, and that will be plotted using a matplotlib window, which is integrated in Qt. So matplotlib uh, can also be used in your own user interfaces, which is kind of nice. So you don't have to implement the, all the diagram drawing functionality in, um, in matplotlib. So, any final questions or, I know this is a lot, lot to kind of take in in a two hour lecture, um, but I encourage you to kind of experiment with the example code I have provided you. There are some case, uh, more complex cases as well uh, in a separate folder. So you can uh, call cases 